Um, welcome everybody to the uh, Cow Sustainability um, Seminar Series. Uh, I'll uh, be facilitating um, tonight and uh, I'm a PhD student here at KAUST and part of um, S Squared Students for Sustainability, which is um, puts on these seminars. So it is my pleasure tonight to introduce um, William McDonough, who is a globally recognized leader in sustainable design and development. He co-authored Cradle to Cradle, Remaking the Way We Make Things in 2002, um, and is widely recognized as a seminal text of both the sustainability and the circular economy design movements. He advises global leaders through McDonough Innovation, is an architect, and uh, recently um, he now is a distinguished research professor at here at uh, KAUST, focused on the circular carbon economy. Um, he has been a faculty of Stanford University and served as the A.D. White Professor at Large at Cornell University and Dean of the School of Architecture and the Edward E. Uh, Elson uh, Endowed Chair at the University of Virginia. He has received the Presidential Award for Sustainable Development in 1996 and is the first U.S. EPA Presidential Green Chemistry Challenge Award uh, winner uh, and the National Design Award and the Fortune Award for Circular Economy Leadership in 2017. Time Magazine recognized him as Hero for the Planet. And uh, with that, uh, we'll begin the seminar. Um, we'll, we'll be roughly 40, um, 45 minutes. And so uh, while you're watching, uh, write down your questions in the chat box and um, uh, we'll start. Take it away. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to talk to everyone at KAUST today because I've just come back from KAUST and we're doing something quite important, I think, by promulgating detail around the circular carbon economy. And I'd like to talk about how we got there and the history of this and where we might wanna go next. So for me, I'm interested in remaking the way we make things. It seems as if the, the big instruction of the first industrial revolution could have sounded like if brute force isn't working, we're not using enough of it. And if we look at the underlying protocols, we discover many things that are untoward and that at this point in history, we're actually having conversations about net zero because we're worried about what we do. And so wouldn't it be better if we did nothing, I guess. But it's really a design question for me. So I'm a designer and I see design as the first signal of human intention. So what if our intention was to make the world better through commerce by design? And that's why we've created Cradle to Cradle leading to a circular economy and now circular carbon economy. These are all aligned and in my history, go back to uh, the er early 90s, the mid 90s, and then currently. So fundamentally what we're doing and what we're doing now, and the great thing is I get to work with Carlos Duarte, for example, at CAST um, on a regular basis. We're designing for the regenerative biosphere and the circular technosphere. These are terms that I've put forward and circular technos here. And working with the biologists like Carlos and others, we're talking about the regenerative biosphere. So Cradle to Cradle, which was published in 2002 and first in the Atlantic Monthly uh, in 1998, looked at the idea that there's biological nutrition and technical nutrition. And that things that can go back to nature, we call products of consumption. We can actually consume them. Toothpaste, cotton, can go back to the natural systems and refresh it. And in the technosphere, we call them technical nutrients. We see these products as a service. So a washing machine is something that cleans clothes. You don't need to own all the molecules. What you want are clean clothes. So we can take that steel and aluminum, aluminum, and rubber, and glass, 
and, and make it available to the next generation by designing for next use. So it's providing a service, a light fixture, if you like, but the indium, the gallium, the aluminum can all be kept by the company that made it in effect so that it can reuse them again. These kinds of ideas are important because if we look at an article from Nature in December last year, it pointed out that the, the dry mass of the biosphere has now been exceeded by the dry mass of things made by humans. So these actually are the same size if you look at dry mass. So this is an important idea because the technosphere is overwhelming the biosphere. So we really need a regenerative biosphere with living carbon in cycles, and we need the circular technosphere with durable carbon in cycles. Because this grows out of a study I was thinking about uh, on how to find language for carbon, which we'll get to in a minute. But you put these two spheres together and you end up with a circular economy. Some things to go back to soil, some things to go back to industry. And we have to drive it. And what we found, and then working with, with um, the G20 program for the King, from the kingdom last year, uh, was what we found is if we just look at the carbon, we realized that the system is driven by carbon. So carbon is both a material and a fuel. And that makes it special. Because in the circular economy and the regenerative economy, we want to recycle things. We want to reduce things we don't want. We want to reuse things that we need over and over again. But all of a sudden, we realize that this is being powered by materials that are carbon, but also energy that's carbon-based. And that's an issue as far as the atmosphere is concerned, as we all well know. So we've already reached a point where we have to start removing carbon from the atmosphere, letting nature-based solutions uh, and enhancing them and also developing technical solutions over time while we refigure the materials coming from the geosphere to the atmosphere. So this is a really important idea and it's coming out of the G20. So when we think about human beings in our home, we see this 1968, Apollo 8, and all of a sudden, we see the Earth's matter space. Uh, and once we see that, we realize there's home. And it's a finite system, in a sense. There it is. That's what we've got. So away has gone away. How do you throw something away? So we don't throw things away anymore. Look at this place. Now, when we start to understand its operating system and its design, this is from my perspective, I'm not a scientist, but as a designer, what I see here is we see the energy coming from the sun. It's the entropy, uh, chaos of energy from the sun coming to us as photons, a form of income, energy income. And then we see a planet full of materials, rocks, water, and so on. And that that's chemistry. And all of a sudden those materials start to aggregate into something that sort of all of a sudden leaps into life. And we have energy, meaning materials, and we get life. And so in a strange way, what we see here is a form of physics meets chemistry and becomes biology. And that's us. And we're humans. And the, these things all combining create humus on the terrestrial landscape. They create verdure in the oceans. But this idea of photosynthesis causing biology, living things, is really quite important. But at the same time, what's happened is we now are in, as people often reference, the epoch of the Anthropocene, the time of human influence uh, controlling the planet. All large mammals, for all intents and purposes, are under human management at this point. We can affect the entire world with our behaviors, uh, as we have seen, climate, oceans, land, and so on. So what's happening is that humans are actually affecting the planet at every level. So wouldn't it be wonderful if we could design for things that are safe and healthy molecules? What about products that are safe and healthy and reusable? Ooh, across generations. And then 
What if we had buildings, communities, and cities that follow the same guidelines? And what if we had regions and a country and a whole planet? So what I love about the work we get to do is that we get to work at every scale. So as a designer, I work at all those scales. And it's the same principles. There we go. So what is that? It's about humans expressing values like the good, the bad, the right, the wrong, the moral, the immoral. Those are our values. What do we believe to be true? What is beautiful? What is good? What is bad? That kind of thing. But we then move to value and number and science. So we have values, our beliefs, and we have value, the things we know to be true scientifically, or statistically, or numerically. So as designers, I think what's exciting for me is we get the design from values to value. So what do we believe in? Well, then we need principles. What guides us in our design? These are your principles. And then what visions do we have for the future? What do we see? Like we just saw the planet from outer space, powered by the sun, circulating materials. We then have our goals we can set once we have the visions, like what is the good goal? Let's go there. And then what strategies do we want? What tactics can we do, short-term strategies? What numbers are we gonna to use to measure our success? And how do we produce value? Numerical, scientific, and so on. So we work from our values to value. Because if we start with value and number and move to goals, then we're just benchmarking. So often you'll see people who are benchmarking. Their goal is to be 30% less whatever than they were yesterday. And we're also starting to see goals like net zero. Well, net zero what? Net zero of things we don't want, right? What about things we do want? So I think if we start with quality instead of quantity, I say, what do we want? What is beautiful? We need principles, visions, goals, strategies, tactics, et cetera. Produce the value. So we get the value, but we're not just benchmarking. We're actually creating something which is valuable. So these are our values. So what values do we use? For me, I always like to start a design pro project with this question. How do we love all the children of all species for all time? Not just our own children, everyone's children not just humans, but the whole world. How do we do that? So the question becomes for designers, how do we make the world better through commerce, typically by design? So the issue I see here is that we've created sort of eco-efficiency here, efficiency, but as Peter Drucker points out, it's a manager's job to do things the right way and to be efficient, but it's the executive's job to do the right things, then give it to the managers to do the right way. So in a kingdom, Saudi Arabia, for example, they're trying to figure out what are the right things to do based on you know, the potentials in the future and so on. Because the problem is if we end up doing the wrong things, and we do them perfectly with Six Sigma perfection, well, then we're perfectly wrong. So what are the principles with which we operate? Uh, so in uh, 1991, 92, I wrote the Hanover Principles and they ended up being a gift of Germany to the Earth Summit. And these are nine design principles. Insist on the rights of humanity and nature to coexist. Recognize interdependence. Respect the relationships between spirit and matter. There are things we find beautiful. There are things we find meaningful. Accept responsibility for the consequences of design. Create safe objects of long-term value. Eliminate the concept of waste. This doesn't say reduce, minimize, avoid. It says eliminate the entire concept. Rely on natural energy flows. Be humble. Understand the limitations of design. If anybody has trouble with the idea of being humble by design, just remember it took us 5,000 years to put wheels on our luggage. And we went to the moon before we put wheels on our luggage. And it took us another 20 years to put four wheels on our luggage. So we're working on it. And then seek constant improvement by the sharing of knowledge, which is what we're doing today. So here are the principles. And it's exciting to use these as you're designing because they're like a fulcrum for the levers of change. So we can say, these are things I hold to be true. 
These are my values represented by assignments, things we can do. And, and they, they hold up at every scale. So I think that's really exciting for me. So those are principles. Then we have visions. Now for the Earth Summit, the vision was to connect the social and the economic with the environment. Because we used to have uh, a market economy. We had social market economy in 1992. Uh, and all of a sudden we're saying, well, let's bring in the environment. So we're seeing social and capital and they turn into as extreme socialism or capitalism. And then we realize isms are tricky because they're kind of absolute. So when we look at the idea of environmentalism and we bring it together, we have to do all three at once. That's the new paradigm, but it's not just a Venn diagram with lots of overlapping circles. It's actually quite potentially precise in for a design tool. So I created this uh, and we wrote about it in our book, Cradle to Cradle, and it's really useful for us. So we can ask the question in the economy corner, because remember, this is what's known as a fractal tile. It's self-similar at every scale. The economy question, pure economy, would be, are you making a profit? If you're not, you're not a business. So, so you're not here. Then we ask on social, are, are, are people earning a living wage? That's the social dimension of economy. Then we have the economy dimension of social. Like, are men and women paid the same for the same work? Oh, good question. And then we would have just the social question. What about people? Are people being treated with respect? This is where we would find racism or sexism or imbalances around those conditions. And then we have the social environment. Well, are people being exposed to toxins in the workplace and the use of products? Is that fair to do that? And then we have the environment social. Are we damaging the atmosphere, the rivers for future generations? So is that fair to leave people with climate change or, or devastations of various kinds in the environment? So the environment environment question is, are we following the laws of nature? I'm an architect, I have to follow the law of gravity. It's not just a good idea, it's a law. We have the second law of thermodynamics. You know. And so environment economy would be, are we providing ecological benefit while doing business? So what if we follow laws of nature while we do our business? And it's very exciting to see projects going on right now that we're involved in there that are doing this. Imagine what we could do at KAUST, for example. And then the economy environment, are we being cost effective as we do these things? And are we operating with and minimizing our ecological burdens? This would be eco-efficiency, for example. Are we being efficient with our use of resources? And so this I consider as being called the triple bottom line because it's related to profit and what's left over when we do these things. And this is really the triple bottom line, eco-efficiency, financial profit, and some corporate social responsibility. But that's the circular economy and it's the economy in a circle. So it's just the economy in a circle, there it is. Now, what we're looking at generally now within with ESG and things like that, environment, social governance, is a triple top line. It's what executives do. It's what leaders do. They produce revenue. They produce a public good. They produce health. And so it's about value creation that executives and leaders are meant to be doing as they work. And that means we have a positively defined co-creative process that celebrates diversity and long-term health and growth. So that becomes our environment, social governance framework. And so we can use this with enterprises of all kinds as a tool and as a measuring device. Very exciting. Now, what goals can we set for ourselves? You see a lot and hear a lot about net zero as a goal. All these companies, all the things going on for the COP26 in Glasgow, on and on and on, net zero. Well. If net zero is your goal, then you're saying my goal is nothing. So nothing what? It would be nothing negative. Oh, so we have to ask ourselves, what are our goals? So is a net negative? What would that look like? Oh, that means we're worse. Uh, a net zero? Are we talking about bad things? And we're trying to be net zero bad things? So what I'd like to talk about is what it would mean to be net positive? of good things, a different way of looking at it. Because net zero means nothing. 
let's do about what about good because being less bad in my book is not being good by definition you're being bad that's the human values and less is a numerical value so you're combining less a numerical value with bad a human value so being less bad is not being good it's being bad by definition just less so and if you made it into a goal it sounds like this a less unsafe less unhealthy less unjust world less polluted air soil water and power economically driven well is that it that's what we go home and tell our families we're doing so when we look at it we say well it looks like this all the time in corporate social responsibility reporting and so on it looks like this so our goal is nothing and we're going to reduce something by x percent by time certain well what we're saying is we're going to be less bad but we're not telling you what we're going to do we're telling you what we're not going to do so imagine telling a taxi driver quick i'm not going to the airport how useful is this it is information and it is important for us to be less bad and our goal can be no less bad that's good but this doesn't tell us what to do so what if we try to be more good well then this goal statement is no longer less this that and the other thing it's a delightfully diverse safe healthy and just world with clean air soil water and power economically equitably ecologically and elegantly enjoyed ah now we have a goal so let's take all those things we don't want which look like this and let's put them down here so up and to the right that is a positive direction and our goal is nothing in this area good okay so then we can say okay now what do we want to do what is good what replaces the bad as we go and so this is our diagram for net positive chart constant improvement where we're looking at you know choices on the left green red good bad whatever take take a campus and start to say what's ideal here what would be ideal what is not ideal let's change our system based on this idea that we get rid of the things that are degenerative or linear that are one way and uh, don't have any next use or don't benefit future generations okay and let's start doing things that are regenerative and circular restorative landscapes circular materials and loops so we become net positive so we have net zero bads and we start to see if we can't get the greens bigger than the reds let's go so then as we saw in the hierarchy before we have strategies tactics metrics and then value creation so i'm going to show you my strategies and then i'll show you some of the creations so the first thing we have to do as an architect i like to change the way we see so if you see weeds growing and then say oh terrible weeds but for a butterfly or a bee they see something to pollinate so it's food so this how do we see and then once we change what we see we can change what what we do and then we can change how we measure so apparently what we see on the left is a yellow flower for a butterfly or a bee they see something akin to this food a target beautiful so they see different things i remember watching a child in a daycare center and they were eating the building and i kept wondering what are they eating so what do we see what's going on in these pictures when we see fashion i'm very involved in fashion today and we created fashion for good in amsterdam when you see this you see fashion we see a runway we see clothing we see apparel great and we love changing and playing with those kinds of things but if you are a toxicologist what might you see you might see this because that's what's going on at the molecular level here and how it affects us and affects the planet where does it come from where does it go so why do we care well these kinds of conditions start to exist when we aren't thoughtful about what materials we use and what context and so on so let's get down to the molecules in detail because how could something be beautiful if it damages children's health or destroys the environment 
It is a question of beauty. It is a question of science. So that's what Cradle to Cradle Inspired Design is. It looks at these two spheres, the biosphere and the technosphere. It says safe and healthy materials here. And let's put them into perpetual patterns of use. So product as a service in the technosphere is something we essentially borrow from our future generations and then send it back for remaking, remaking the way we make things. And the principles are waste equals food. We eliminate the concept of waste. We use clean energy and we celebrate diversity. This is how nature works. This is how we can work. And as we moved into the up cycle, everything is food. We use clean energy and we celebrate diversity. Everything is food for something else. Vintage Classics in London just published five books that changed the way we see the world and they put Cradle to Cradle in the middle, sandwiched it between the origin of species and some of the other books. Put it right there next to the origin of species. How fun is that? Now, what we're seeing is goods and services, but also goods as services, as I mentioned. The washing machine is giving you clean clothes. The materials are there for reutilization. So Cradle to Cradle is designed for use and next use without the end of life. Now, life cycle assessment is a scientific protocol. It's very important. But when we say let's design for use and next use, we're not saying design for end of life. Because then you're scientifically designing for the actual disposition that we might expect in real life, like landfill. And say, okay, in a landfill, this is what happens. But it's, it's really not that human projection. It's actually, we're gonna design it for this use. And then we can say, what about the next use? Instead of saying design for the end, we're designing it for use. Well then, what's the next use? It begs that question. Welcome to the circular economy. Now, the stack that we use as a set of priorities can be in any order, but I like to put it this way. First is material health. Let's make sure everything we design is healthy and safe. Then we have a circular economy and we reuse things, but it's second for a reason, because what, would it, what good would it be to have a circular economy of toxic materials? We're just doing it again, that's worse. So circular economy is second. It's like, a, we wanna use renewable energy that are clean. We wanna use restorative carbon balances, which we're looking at with this idea of remove and so on in circular carbon economy. And we want water stewardship because we need clean water in production and use cycles and clean water for every child every day. And we need social fairness and to share this abundance. So we created a product standard that's many pages and a lot of science. This was done, uh, I did this with Dr. Michael Weingart, a uh, German chemist, and here it is. And now it's become an institute. It's third party, independent, peer reviewed, science based institute. And we can certify products there. They certify products against the standard that we create. So it's evolving and it's quite wonderful to watch. And it's being adopted by people. Walmart, our biggest corporate enterprise in the US and uh, in retail. Uh, and we have other retailers. We have building standards. We have government agencies using this to help them. Amazon chose it as a primary one, uh, excuse me, with uh, to get access to the best products for their customers. So these kinds of things are really exciting when people say it's possible you know, because it exists. Let's go for this quality because the circular economy is quantification, doing something again and, and letting that value continuously cycle. But cradle to cradle is about quality. So cradle to cradle circular economy, which is being taken up by people is really these two things connected in an economic system that drives both circles for us. So that's our, our gift to the world of thinking about circular economy. It's this kind of thing. It's not just the linear economy of a circle. So uh, the linear economy of take, make, waste in a circular economy becomes retake, remake, restore, regenerate. So I first started proposing this and promoting it in China uh, in the 90s. And we this paper that I'm holding in my hand is called Cradle to Cradle and Circular Economy, the Search for Eco-Civilization. And uh, it was, uh, China had a 12th and 13th five-year plan. It's called Circular Economy. So this is good. And when we look at the history of this, it's starting to take off. 
very exciting. And so you know, World Economic Forum, we presented it in 2014. Uh, I was the chair for the first Meta Council for Circular Economy there. Other place, people and places, Netherlands, England, have uh, taken this on. So we're now seeing the circular economy being presented in various places. Sometimes as the linear economy a circle, but we keep pushing for the idea of these two cycles. Now, what we're looking at then is really the search for the good in terms of human values. So what are good materials, good economy, good energy, good water, and good lives? So let me give some examples. Good materials would be safe, healthy, and biological tactical cycles. Uh, NASA built the space station and asked us to work on the Mars space station. We said, why don't we build a space station on Earth first with the rocket scientists? And let's go back to Earth. Let's do an Earth shot. So we did. So this is NASA's research center at Ames uh, near Google's headquarters. And it's uh, the materials are designed to go back into cycles with these companies. So they can be disassembled and become useful materials in the future. Uh, at Park 2020, a project in the Netherlands, every project we did there expanded the no, number of products that we could use that were safe and healthy against these protocols. Companies like Herman Miller, uh, where we design their factory, design furniture that can be seen as technical nutrients of the future. CNA, a uh, retailer in Europe and Brazil, and, uh, has been able to create sustainable jeans uh, for 28 euros. This is mass market pricing for organic cotton with safe materials. L'Oreal, the world's biggest personal care company, is taking on cradle to cradle as its quality standard. So. This is moving. A good economy would be circular, certainly sharing and shared, not just Airbnb and over sharing materials more and more, that's fine. But it's also shared with uh, almost everyone. That's important, not just a few. So redesigning the carpet industry, we work with uh, Berkshire Hathaway and we design carpets that are designed to go back. So you can actually call and they will pick it up because it's the raw materials of their industry. So. It's the service of carpet you're getting, the acoustics, the color, the performance, and you actually, the raw materials and the molecules can go back to the company to become carpet again, because it's designed to do that. It reduces cost, it reduces weight, and it's now the largest carpet company in the world. The uh, Philips is now, you know, as I mentioned, they're selling you light uh, and keeping uh, track of their materials so they can get them back and reuse them and give you the price benefit this kind of thing. So we applied this to a project in Netherlands way back, starting way back when, and it's the first circular economy development in real estate done by, um, at Park 2020 by a great real estate developer, uh, Delta Development, Kurt Zakriasen. So there they are, and at every building we added more new materials. With Sabic, we created the Ice House in Davos, and it's innovation for the circular economy. And these are materials that are designed to go back to industry, but this actual building is a circular building. It can be taken apart and put up and goes up in a day and a half, comes down in a day, and it's warm and toasty and the walls are only uh, three centimeters thick because we're using aerogels, advanced materials that can be reused. So. This is a wonderful thing. It's a safe place for people to come and talk. We take the same strategies of disassembly and so on. And we just finished this university, in Bogota, Colombia, where the, these, this wonder frame on the outside gives it shade and makes the building cheerful. It's like a tree. And uh, the air is taken in above the windows and dragged through the building by by a thermal system on the back, which are just thermal chimneys. So the building is breathing building. It's bringing air through filters all the way through the building and out the ceiling, out the roof, uh, naturally uh, powered by the air. But then you can see, you know, uh, that the skin is fun because you can see it outside the building and look through it and things like that. So uh, that's uh, the, the, circular economy writ large because that's training people who are going to be in small and medium sized enterprises to do business this way. Good energy is clean and renewable. And I wrote an article in Nature in uh, 2016 
called Karma is Not the Enemy. And this illustration, it's kind of fun because you look at it and change the way you see. A lot of people look at that immediately and go, oh, it must be Beijing and pollution or something. That's a fog in Vancouver above a green roof of the convention center. So that's not a horrifying picture. That's quite a beautiful picture though. So the idea of looking at carbon through these lenses is like we have living carbon, we have durable carbon, we have fugitive carbon. Carbon from the atmosphere to the earth, making verdure and so on, living carbon, it's positive behavior. We have durable carbon, carbon that we use over and over again, or sitting still or recycled plastics or wood beams, that's durable carbon. But then we have the fugitive carbon, which is carbon escaping to the atmosphere or plastics escaping to the ocean. And do we really want that? So let's reduce the fugitive, let's increase the durable, and let's increase the living. And so these are buildings that we've designed that do these things, buildings that are net positive on energy, imagine, or net positive on biodiversity. This is the ancient grasses of this place, uh, YouTube's headquarters, imagine. Uh, so part of it is the meadows, the ancient grasses, part of it is solar energy, and of course, and then we can build it with wood now, we just have to use steel. We thought about what about cities that were positive, carbon positive, how exciting. Think of all the city work going on it's in uh, the world right now. And this is exciting. These are This is a city that can power itself, feed itself, uh, you know, it's conceptually. And this is the direction we can move in. And so we can start to thinking of even urban development as linear flows. And now we can talk about circular cities. So carbon positive cities, imagine, of course we could. It's where we can use geothermal energy. We can start, you know, recycling materials, recycling carbon from food. As uh, if put instead of saying sewage, we say fertilizer, and and then the privilege of working with uh, the Capsarc and in Riyadh for the G20 was this circular carbon economy being developed there. For that, we had the pleasure of working with that and putting these protocols into the into the booklet. So there's the diagram, and this is developed. Uh, I did this for the G20 and then had uh, collaborated with Carlos Duarte from uh, Kaust to flesh it out and put uh, dimension. And, uh, and the idea here is we have to massively reduce our emissions and massively increase our renewable power in the center so that we can deal with the atmosphere with dignity and grace. We have to do removal from carbon from the atmosphere using nature-based solutions on the left and using uh, mechanical and human creativity on the right. But we have to do everything we can to decarbonize that atmosphere as we go forward. And so this diagram I think will help people find their way through it. So the G20 had a leader's declaration that, that endorsed this strategy. Uh, which is really a great privilege and, and fair play. So clean water is meant to be a human right. So we've designed textiles where the water coming out of the, the factories is clean enough to drink. Uh, here is uh, Ford Motor Company's Ford River Rouge, had the world's largest green roof, and uh, it purified water without chemical treatment plants. And a lot of pipes that used natural systems, it swales, it and it reduced the cost by $35 million over conventional water treatment by using natural systems, which with the, the cars at a 4% margin, it's the same as walking into the port and giving them an order for $900 million worth of cars. And the birds loved it. The project was for the birds. And that was true, strange as it may sound. There you go, there's killdeer eggs on the lower left. These birds arrive within five days of the roof being rolled out like a carpet. So these are exciting things to do. And that's about pure water and then good lives. Good lives are safe and they're creative and they're dignified. So what can we do with things like that? This is a factory we designed for the world's largest motorcycle company in Nimrana, India, near Delhi. And this is um, Hero. They're now the world's largest motorcycle company. We said, well, the factory should also have a farming on the roof. So the people inside are working on building motorcycles and the people are working on the roof, growing food for their families. So we alternate between solar collectors and greenhouses. 
because we can use the structure, which is all on the roof, so it can be disassembled in the future, and it's out of the way of manufacturing. And so we have solar, greenhouse, solar, greenhouse. So they make their electricity, but they also grow food for their families. Uh, so this is exciting. And I'd like to close with a rather emotional thought. This is Dr. Ben Kataswamy, Madurai, India. He passed away a number of years ago. But he's a cataract surgeon. And he said, why does it take $9,000 to get your eyesight back when you're older? And when I can do it in 10 minutes, and I need a cubic meter of sterility, and why are these lenses $250 each when we make contact lenses that are disposable at this point? Why? And so he ended up saying, if I gave away cataract surgery for free, I could get, I'll help a lot of people and I need enough lenses to be able to go to mass production. And then the people who can afford anything could pay more, if they wish, but to fund the whole system. So what if we try that? Anyway, when he died, he had given eyesight to 3 million people for free. And his hospitals were running. And if you, had, if you could afford to pay for it, all you had to do is pay $50. If you couldn't afford it, he gave it for free. That is an amazing story to me because it's more than statistical significance. It has immense meaning. I think we need wise people as well as smart people. So as we look at our students, let us look at them and ask intelligence and wisdom. So as I look at the 17 sustainable development goals, they're hard to argue with. I mean, here we are at a university, quality education, okay. But what else is here? Why not have a, a you know, campus that's good health. You have food, uh, you have renewable energy, you have responsible consumption. You certainly have life below water. You're saving coral reefs. Um, you know, and all these things are things we want. But look up top there. Those are the five goods that I mentioned of cradle to cradle. And they're predicate to all 17 sustainable development goals. We need them all that any one of those down below needs benefit from these. So there we are. So we change the question of commerce itself. We change the way we see. We ask how can we make the world better through commerce by design. So the question is no longer the current question of capitalism. How much can I get for how little I give? That's statistically significant, but its meaning may leave us wanting. And we change the question to how much can we give for all that we get? The celebration of abundance of the natural world and human creativity and goodwill. Think positive. Let's make the world better because we're here. Thank you. Thanks for the wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, we'll open the floor up to questions. So if anybody uh, has um, uh, any comments, questions, you can throw them to the chat window or raise your hand and we'll, we'll call on you. Um, we have one from Stefan. Uh, he says, hello, very interesting concepts. Can you implement circular economy to different industries that are, not, or that are net negative to cancel each other's negatives somehow? That's a really good question. It, it relates to the notion of offsets. And you'll hear a lot about offsets in the world of carbon, for example. We have to be very careful because I think offsets are gonna come into question during COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, because it's something we use and have used over the years and it was important. We would say, if we have something that like is releasing carbon, you know, at a level we prefer not to, that we could use carbon offsets. So we will put in renewable power somewhere and say, here's a megawatt of renewables, here's a megawatt of carbon production. We're offsetting our carbon emissions by this renewable activity. Or we'll say, 
let's you know protect a forest of a certain amount of carbon in sequestration to offset our carbon releases. But actually that forest is working already. So your net isn't necessarily gonna change. You just said, I'm gonna pay to protect this, which is a great idea. So yes, do those things. But if we look at that diagram, we have a net positive. If you offset this much carbon release or this much toxic product, for example, in an untoward industry, and then you say, I'm offsetting that somewhere else or something else, it's kind of odd because you're, you're, what we realize, the, what we really have to do is take down a chimney when we put in the renewables. We have to reduce the carbon and, and then create the new energy. We just can't add renewable energy to the mix and just keep the same amount of base release of the thing we don't want. So that's an important concept is this idea of offset. It's an important thing to do, uh, but we also can go beyond that. So it is hard to offset, say, toxins. If, you, if you're releasing lead out of a production into water, you don't say, well, I'm gonna go somewhere and re remove lead from some other place in the water and, and you're gonna be lead neutral. It doesn't make sense. So, um, so you, we really do need to understand how that works. So I, that's why I think thinking positive is really important because even that textile I showed you from, was from Switzerland and by redesigning it with all its chemistries, we were able to make a product that produced drinking water uh, and it's safe enough to eat. So it's the fabric on an Airbus. Uh, works beautifully and doesn't need complex regulations. And doesn't pollute water. And, you know, it's, it's less expensive to make because it doesn't have to be regulated. And you don't produce hazardous waste. You have to ship to another country, you know, et cetera. So I think redesign is probably the thing I would encourage before just offsets. I get creative, do something. Don't just not do something. Yeah. Our, our next question is from uh, Jawa here. He has two questions actually. Um, his first is my uh, background is in material science and electrical engineering. I recently finished my PhD and now I'm interested in public policy um, related to climate change. Any tips on how to get there from where I am now? Great question. Well, if we look at the history of some of these things, I, I was reflecting, for example, on say Tesla or other advances that we've seen that sort of shifted gears, so to speak, from conventional behavior, just being less bad and actually changed the game. Like, let's get the electric vehicle out there. And so, and we see the same thing in technology and electronics. Uh, it's surprising how much the gaming industry has affected the modern electronics because of the processors for graphics are so fast and powerful. They're now coming into the regular universe of computation and so on too. So there's a lot of sources for this transformations, but on the material science side, the development of new products uh, and the idea of regulation and policy. I think the nice thing for us about what we're trying to do is you design where you don't need regulation because a lot of businesses don't like regulation. It's a cost and it's, it's expensive and it requires a lot of things but if you design something so safe you can eat it then it's not regulated well that's the way not to be regulated you're doing something so safe you don't need to be regulated um, that's pretty interesting i find that very productive so then when you get to this question of regulation is you know if you look at the the emissions regulations in california well uh you know electric cars you know jump right to the front of the line. Then you got to look upstream and say, well, where'd the energy for the battery come from? And, you know, the sourcing. You start to get into all those kinds of questions, which is good. But on the regulatory side, I think if we look at it, we see that people have insights and they have an idea like, oh, let's have an electric car. Now, that's not a new idea. It's an idea, an important one in this context. Then you move to the next level, which would be, okay, I've had an insight. Now you start working on execution. And as it goes, you start developing standards 
because you need standards for what you're doing in order to execute it. And then what if that is something you give away to the public? Like when Elon Musk released his patents. I mean, that's not stupid because he also is creating a standard. Like this is how we charge a car. You can have this if you want it. And guess what? It gets to go out in the world. And that's good for him because that means his cars get charged too. And everybody gets to go toward that direction. So I think that's why I like cradle to cradle. It's not a law. It's not a regulation. It's just a design protocol that's a standard. And if you meet that standard, then you're doing something that probably, you know, would be happy for regulators. They would look at it and go, oh, okay, there we go. So, so that moves us into standards. And those are industry standards. They're being taken up by an industry trying to do great work. And then at that point, policymakers can then look at it and go, wait a second, you can make fabrics that don't pollute and have clean water. You can make fabrics that are safe enough to eat. What? They can then refer to that and say, well, if they can do it, why can't everybody do it? And that all of a sudden becomes part of the regulatory framework because a policymakers can say, like in Europe, for example, they're saying, we want X percent recycled content in whatever, because they've seen somebody actually do that. And then they'll say that let's be a policy. Once the policies gets in place, because policymakers can't get into the nitty gritty, but they can say that it exists, therefore it is possible. Why can't you do it? And then it turns into regulation after about 10 years uh, of time, because they can say, no, everybody could do this now. We see that it's possible. Let's all do it. So we just want to be way ahead of all the regulations and say, why don't we design things that don't require regulation? Then they can become standards and then they can become policies. And, you know, the world gets better because we're here. Um, another question. Uh, you just returned from a trip to KAUST. What would be your highest priority changes you would make at our university to make us more sustainable? Well, we actually talked about a lot of things here. One is that I think we have an, a really serious curiosity about the geothermal opportunities in the world. And since KAUST is on the East African Rift, you know, the potential for heat below the ground is pretty interesting as we get down there with the history of a country that knows how to drill holes. This is a really exciting thing for us to look at. And we're seeing in California or in China, for example, they're, they're now putting geothermal heat wells in the cities that allow them to replace the coal-fired plants um, in the district heating system. So you can keep the district heating system with the fluid management, but you replace the coal-fired plant boilers and chimneys with geothermal uh, heat from below the ground. And they go down, you know, two and a half kilometers. So it's, it's not shallow. And that kind of thing is really interesting. And so there's a whole world of exploration that's worthy of, of interest. And so one of the things at Cows we looked at was like, oh, what would that look like? What does it mean? You have professors working on these things, pretty exciting. So we'll see, but it's the kind of question that can be asked at a university and have all these marvelous people weighing in on what the potentials are. So that's one, it's what if you had a renewably powered university? I think that's a big opportunity. And with the price of electricity and solar in the kingdom now, this is not the same. And in fact, it's really part of a national strategy. That's what NEOM's doing. That's what Red Sea Development's doing. So join the party, oh, that'd be one. And then the other would be just the fact that we have chemists at KAUST and, and biologists, wow. So you know, what can we do with chemistry protocols like this that we're showing here? And what if we have a, we set up a place that can help examine materials for health and safety and be part of this same movement. We can even create a branch of it here. I'm really curious about that. Even if it just stimulates the conversation, uh, how do we put purpose into our practice? Yeah, so. Um, next question is a uh, brilliant presentation, very beneficial. A more general question. Realistically, how long do you reckon the duration for implementing a large chunk of such systems and technology would take? Perhaps regionally, then in the wider spectrum. Well, I like to say it's going to take forever, but that's the point. So <laughs> I don't know like, what part of it is going to take how long, but uh, 
a lot of these things, I mean, I've been at this now for 40 years, imagine. And, uh, you know, it's, I did the first solar heated house in Ireland. Uh, and it just went on the market because the client who turned 90 last year passed away. And her son inherited it. And so he's, he doesn't live there. So he's putting it on the market. It was almost 50 years ago. He did it while I was a student at, at Yale doing my master's degree. I built it by hand and it's there. And it's been there 50 years, but it's probably the loneliest solar building anywhere because Ireland didn't take up solar energy all the time, you know, and now they're getting into wind and they're getting into all these other things, of course. So this takes time, it takes lifetimes. Certainly in my case, I'm really slow, you know, either that or I'm just way too early, but whatever. Uh, yeah. Everybody has to do their best because it's going to take forever, but it's also going to take all of us. So it's going to take us all. It's going to take forever, but that's the point. Uh, this next uh, question uh, says, hi, professor. Thanks for this wonderful talk. Although my question is not relevant to C2C, um, but you spoke about being wise and smart. How do you differentiate between the two? Well, I think from one level, we could look at it as smart could be sort of, if we look at the Aristotelian side of the coin. So it's, let's just say it's statistical significance and your ability to have like a smart building today would be full of sensors and it would be able to turn things on and off when they're needed or not needed, that kind of thing. So you'd say that's smart because it, it's got, this essentially artificial intelligence in it to help optimize systems of engineering and otherwise. So that's smart. That's smart. Let's not, you know, burn things we don't need to. Let's not heat and cool ghosts. Let's not light people that aren't there. I mean, it's smart. Let's not do that. But wise is what is meaningful? What matters, right? So smart might be turn off the lights when nobody's there, but wise might be leave a light on at the lobby <laughs> so that people feel safe, see, like that. Yeah. It may not be smart in terms of the number of kilo hours, but it's certainly wise to let people feel safe. So wise might be, to let people feel connected, to communicate with each other, to enjoy culture, to do that kind of thing. Whereas smart might be minimization, optimization, and you know, so minimize, avoid, reduce. But what about encourage and create? So what if we had more light or more hot water instead of less? How about more water instead of less? Well, because we've reused the water and we figured out how to cycle it. So we're not desperate and we're not, you know, producing it in some abstract way we don't understand that has bad effects. That would be wise. Let's make our water out of the air. Oh, that might be wise. And who knows? How do you, um, uh, uh, with you mentioned Amazon and some other companies adopting cradle to cradle, how do you ensure that the products that people buy are then recycled and they don't just end up in landfills? Because wouldn't couldn't the yeah. having things marked as cradle to cradle like encourage consumerism if they don't take the oh. next step and uh, then yeah. go and recycle? Them? That's interesting. Yeah, no, that's a great question. See, a lot of wise people here. Uh, good question. And it's a smart question too. Um, and it's a, it is a great question because it is one of the questions. So what we've been doing is designing it so it could be, but that's as good as we can do it until the systems are in place to do it. So it's the real question, absolutely right. The issue of consumption and encouraging consumption through people feeling like it's okay, really <laughs> needs to be brought back to the question of you can't consume a TV set, for example. Uh, so, you know, it's a product of service. So we are now designing packaging, 
for some of the biggest companies in the world that if it's going to go fugitive, like a sachet with soap in it, little thing, then it should probably go back to the biosphere safely, back to hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, because the odds are it's going to go fugitive, right? Now, if you said to somebody, we're going to design your candy wrapper so that it can go back to soil safely in some form or another, or if it gets in the water, it won't contaminate anything over time, then, you know, then somebody might say, yeah, but then you're encouraging people to litter because they're going, oh, it's not a problem. It's like a banana peel. Just throw it over there. Right. So I'm trying to design things that are like banana peels to turn black and disappear within a few days. But that depends then on context because in, in the deserts, you know, is it going to turn into soil in a few days? We, you know, water would be a handy thing to have around. And if you, if you do it in Iceland, you know, where the temperatures are cold, that banana peel will be there next year. So, you know, so the context really does matter. And uh, so I, I would encourage littering of safe, healthy things that are, the soil is waiting for, just the way a cherry blossom leaves the cherry tree and goes back to the soil within days. So fine. But otherwise, you know, I think we should be careful and start designing the systems of recovery and reuse and get them in place. So in the polymer business, it'll be everything from going to biological materials that are going to go fugitive and have no way to collect. They're too small or too you know, indistinguished. And they, they're going to go on the wind or something. Let's make sure we either don't design them to be that way or we can dispense things as dosing you know, without a package and do other things. Fine. And then there's the polymers. And what we might want to do with the polymers is not just recycle, which we can use for mechanically recycling, certainly with polyesters and things like that, and PT, but we also are going to be looking at chemical recycling at large scales, planetary, because we have so much plastic that we could reuse this raw material. So we're going to need those systems of recovery and, and then reuse. So take it back to oil and start over. Great. We have a few more questions, but I noticed it's, uh, we've gone three minutes uh, over time. Oh, do you have a few well, more minutes to spare? Or? I do. I do. Okay. Um, then uh, Yusuf here raised his hand. And so. Um, yes. Hi. Uh, okay. Uh, first off, thank you very much for the interesting presentation, Mr. McDonough. Uh, my question is that we see in both the uh, the bi biological sphere and the technosphere, recycling is a core part of the circular economy. Uh, with regards specifically to the technosphere, in products where recycling their materials takes far more energy or far more cost than simply buying or extracting the raw materials. Uh, the incentive to recycle might be weak in, in those businesses. So how does the concept of circular economy, economy or cradle to cradle reconcile such products where that is the case? Uh, how do they make them viable to, to incentivize businesses to go into taking these products and recycling them rather than just buying new materials to, to make them in the first place? And thank you. That's a, that's a great question and a, a critical one right now. Um, I think it, it, it is a stack of interests. So there's certainly the pressure from society to move in this direction. So that could become part of the regulatory question as you're bringing it up. So, but as you, as you look at the cost incentives, I think people will be driven by the lowest possible price. Um, there's no question. So the the tools we would have in that space would be one, um, you know, taxation. Uh, there's, you know, the whole carbon pricing issue, for example. So if raw material from natural sources sources become more expensive than resources, which are then cataloged for their value to society and so on. So I think we'll see mechanisms that are already underway of pricing, carbon pricing, and otherwise in the area of plastics, for example. I mean, why are people looking for recycled plastic? Well, in the United States, there are many regulations that say you must use recycled content. So that'll be one of the elements. Um, it's not, you know, obviously the most, the high speed, most productive, uh, necessarily um, economic adventure, but it is, has other elements of value in it. 
So there's that. Um, and I think over time, I'm seeing companies that are quite astonishing that have solved that in ways. One is when you look at the whole system, you have the ability to connect to it. There's a company based in Brussels and in India where they, uh, they make arrangements with the rag pickers in India, for example, to collect the plastic bags or collect the whatever, polypropylene. They know how to identify the plastics. They train them. And then they deliver that material to the company who says, we will pay you fairly for the value you're providing us. And so they don't have any middle people sort of squeezing it. So they say, fine, here's the price that's right for that. So thank you. And then they take that product and they have it and they know it's qualified because it's been sorted and selected. And they have a, a processor who knows how to process that polymer. And then they go to that person and say, here, process this. And we will pay you the price of this process. We want the processed resin. And we'll pay you for the resin uh, the right price without a middle person. Oh, okay. So now the company making the, the resin goes, okay, that's good. I have a business. And then the company, since it's big, this larger company, can say, we know who needs polypropylene. We need who, know who needs polyethylene terephthalate. We know who needs this. We can ship it from the processor to someone who needs it for production because they know the whole system without a middle person. So they'll send the materials off to somebody who needs it. And it could be anywhere. So you put that in a container and say from here to there, it's cost effective, let's do that. So they actually see the whole system and the value propositions and take out all the excess uh, handling. Because a lot of this comes down to concentration and flow. You need to be able to concentrate the materials and move them. So your point's well taken. If I can just call up and order you know, some material very cheaply and then use that, that will be the tendency of the marketplace. But if I could have a larger system of benefit, cataloging, social benefit, economic benefit, environmental benefit, and they're all being recognized and rewarded as well as efficient business practice that allows it all to occur at once. Now you've got business geniuses at work and that's very exciting. This next question is from uh, Jason, and he writes, uh, research suggests people of lower socioeconomic status don't, on average, care for or make ecologically smart decisions or actions, which makes sense. What are your thoughts on how to apply your work to accelerate pulling people out of low or no income, uh, creating a feedback loop, so to speak, that will accelerate global commitment to these actions? People of low or no income? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, that story I just told is interesting because if, if you look at it as, you know, collecting something, even if it's as marginal as plastic bag or, or various materials in flow and concentrate and you can get paid for it with dignity and grace, you know, you're part of a vital system. You're not at the bottom of the pyramid, so to speak. You're, respect it for your contribution that can really help um so i think that's one thing the what we saw with dr v with his cataract surgery that can apply in so many different ways too so let's say you want to help young children in india who can't hear how can a child go to school if they can't hear and they'd be amazed you'd be amazed how many children have hearing difficulties and or eyesight difficulty. Sometimes they'll have two lazy eyes and they don't get seen because you test the eyes one at a time. You don't realize that their muscular coordination is not there. So when you look at these children and you say, let's give them hearing. Well, I mean, if we could create, just like he did with cataract lenses, they went from $200 down to $2 each because he could mass produce because he was giving it to the super poor. Imagine that. So we could do the same with hearing aids. We could say, you know, here's hearing aids for these children. And, oh, well, now we have very high-tech digital hearing aids that are really cool. But if you're a rich person, you go out and pay $1,000 for this. But what if we gave it to all the children for free? We could go into mass production and drop the price 
so that you can get it for five hundred dollars and they get it for free. So all of a sudden, you've taken care of our more needy person people. Those kinds of business models are really interesting to me because they they represent generosity and grace, not just limits and greed. Um, so I think that I think that all starts with the consciousness that we're here to help each other. One of the beautiful things that came out of the G20 at Riyadh to me, listening in on all the debates that went on all year and then waiting for the world leaders and so on, was that you could see that the question was not, was moving from uh, how, you know, what's wrong with what you're doing, which is like the dialogue, you know, it's like, uh, and everybody looking for words to explain what they're doing instead of action, right? So it'd be like Nero fiddling while Rome burns, you know, and we'd all be sitting around talking about, is it a conflagration? Is it a fire? Is it a, is it an incendiary moment? I mean, you're sitting here talking about what to call it and, you know, go get a bucket, fill it with water, and run over there and throw the water on the fire. You know, like we can sit here and describe the terms, but what about the fire? So what it was really beautiful at the at the end, and this was led by the presidency there, which was you. Uh, the question really became, let's not argue about this. We all want, we all can express what we want. Germans can express they want to go hydrogen. Uh, you know, you don't argue about it. You just say, fine, how about we sell you some hydrogen? So all of a sudden, the whole policy discussion turns into the discussion of purchase orders. Much more interesting, right? Because the question is becoming, not what's wrong with what you're doing. The question is, how can I help you? And it goes both ways. So, you know, you can sell us electrolyzers. We'll send you hydrogen. Let's exchange purchase orders. You get your policy, we get ours. So, you know, like that. So I think generosity and goodwill is uh, an important question because we have to look at the people of marginal means with love. And how can we help them? I don't know what, what, why we would want to not ask that question or ignore that question or actually the opposite. Say, these are burden. They're not a burden. They're people. They're children. What are you talking about? Um, I had one, one more question. Um, uh, with the the transportation and the, the recycling of a lot of these, these components of the, the circular economy um, re would require quite a bit of energy. Um, and would that all be dependent on renewable energy, considering that renewable systems themselves also depend on uh, um, depleting resources, whether that's uh, ultra pure quartz and coal for solar panel manufacture, et cetera. So is there, do you still run into a resource limitation issue? Um, That's why we need uh, cradle to cradle and circular economy because then we're not depleting, we're repleting. See? So, and, and I think one of the great things you see right now, for example, in Saudi Arabia, um, solar electricity is going to hit probably 1.5 cents a kilowatt hour uh, at some point. Yeah. And, and that's an astonishing thing. So, you know, there's going to be a point where we can make hydrogen, um, you know, at, at the price of diesel. Uh, the steel industry globally is waiting for hydrogen to be a dollar a kilo. At a dollar a kilo, they're going to be making steel, steel with hydrogen all, all the time because it's a great way to make steel. Uh, so, you know, it's all coming. And... Uh, renewable energy is, is really getting cost effective in dramatic ways. I mean, that's why NEOM is going to be 100% renewably powered, not because they're throwing money away. It's because it's going to be the most effective, lowest cost way to power a city. And, and it will create industries that we can share with other people on the planet, too. So it becomes a it's foreign trade potential as well. So... It's a great moment for us all to be figuring out how to do this. So every time you ask a question like that, it's actually the answer to the question is, yeah, I get to work. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, You're right. It's going to take a lot of energy to do this. So, mm -hmm. Great. Uh, thank you for, for joining us for the presentation and answering all of the questions. Uh, um, and uh, we hope to see you back at KAUST uh, uh, sometime soon here. You will. I'll be there for Research Week. Ah, great. Yeah. So I'll see you in December. Sounds good. Thanks. Yeah. You're welcome. Thanks and have a good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.